that. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Does it still seem a little loud to you? Yep. Can you turn that fader on the far right? That's the main speaker. Turn that down just a little bit. Thank you. That does sound better to me. Well, Pastor Jen asked in our prayer just now that uh, she thank God for that we have the freedom to study these things. And it's kind of interesting uh, that she chose that particular prayer when you consider the topic that we're studying tonight, Babylon. What is Babylon again? We learned it uh, this morning and in other sessions. It's that religious political force that unites the world under its delusions to force a false religion on us. Force and religion. State power in a religion. That's what it's all about. So I appreciate that prayer very much. Now, <clears throat> John has twice announced the collapse already of Babylon. And now we're going to go through it again. This morning he did it by talking about the Battle of Armageddon. But now we're going to go through it talking about Babylon in a, we, in a backed up sense now. This is before the Battle of Armageddon. And it's talking about the reasons for her fall. So it's the same entities we're talking about, the same phenomena, but it's backing up and giving us another view of it. John does this, Daniel did it four different times talking about the different beasts and the different symbols, which were all parallel. Well, um, John is doing the exact same thing. And we're going to start out by talking about Babylon and uh, um, yep, starting me just for a moment. I had dropped this a couple of moments ago. <laughs> and when I didn't immediately recognize that picture, I thought, oh, no. But, but it's the right one. We're good. So <clears throat> what a night it was. You remember the stories. You've, you've learned them from when you were a kid. Um, it was the palace of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. There's a, a wild party going on, a party that you would only be able to have if you were immensely wealthy. And if you were also the head of a religious system, so the morals were whatever you decided they should be. Unlimited power, unlimited wealth, a limited state control of the country's religion. And under that setting, could you imagine the parties that an unconverted heart would have? Well, that's the kind of party that he was having. And they were so uh, besotted. The Bible says that they were literally worshiping the gods of silver, gold, and stone. And so they were just having a good old time. But meanwhile, right outside the gates, there was this army that was encamped. But the army had unsuccessfully tried to get through the walls. They just couldn't do it. And you know the story. You've told it before. They diverted the river. And when they did, where the river had flowed underneath the walls, they just marched in. The city was so unprepared. The revelry was so intense. They didn't have any clue what was happening. And this is a very good example of how wealth can come back at you. Who, where are the best views in a city? Where Have you ever lived in a city that had waterfront? Where is the best place to live? right on the waterfront, isn't it? If you're going to buy a place on, uh, you know, the Chicago lakefront, you want it really with the view and all that. Well, of course, that's what the king had, which on that particular night was not the best place to have been. So he was murdered, and that was the end of that. Cyrus and Darius was used uh, by God. And uh, right before they came in, the Bible tells of the story of how uh, Belshazzar was horrified at a miracle that God provided for him. God, with his hand, just like he did the Ten Commandments, he wrote in the stone wall the word,
words, many, many, tekel, parson. Now, having uh, been fluent in a number of Mesopotamian languages, I could translate that for you. But I think what I'll just do is I'll just say what the Bible says. The Bible luckily translates for us because I'm, I'm not too fluent in that. The, the Bible says that God has numbered the end of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting, and your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, it's kind of hard to fathom how all that could be in those four words, but that has to be the expanded meaning of it. But it had to have been enough for uh, the king, because he was absolutely uh, disturbed by it, as he should have been. And then he died. The end of Babylon. Babylon was taken from him, and what was the result of that? God's people were liberated. That's what happened then, and that's what will happen in the future when spiritual Babylon falls, and the scripture tells us, come out of her, my people. The same process. Come out of this, this captivating, delusionary, evil trinity religion. The end of Babylon happens at the end of the world again. And the language, it's a very, very clear. Jeremiah, uh, with them about seven, 600, 700 years uh, before John, he wrote, flee from Babylon, save yourselves, don't get trapped in her punishment. It is the Lord's time for vengeance. He will repay her in full. Babylon has been a gold cup in the Lord's hands, a cup that made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank Babylon's wine and it drove them all mad. But suddenly Babylon too has fallen. Weep for her, give her medicine, perhaps she can yet be healed. So this, this imagery that John is using has its history back in the foundation of Babylon We'll touch upon that in a moment, the very roots of Babylon and how it was formed. He has this as his background for the scripture that he would have been studying in Jeremiah as well as Isaiah. So uh, it's no, um, this is one mystery that we do not have to puzzle over. Why would he use Babylon as such a symbol? Because that's the scripture of his time. Now, these next few verses, Revelation 17, 1 through 6, is, uh, is what we've been calling a guidepost passage because it provides the reasons for God's actions. I'll read it all the way through. The great prostitute, one of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls, came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. And by the way, this is uh, Revelation 17, if you want to follow it. I'm going to be going through Revelation 17. I will depart from it, but I'll always be coming back. So if you want to just keep your finger in that book and make references, if you want to look it up later, to the other texts that uh, are interesting to you, write them in the margin. But, but stay close with me. It'll be easier to follow if we stay together in Revelation 17 see here. So uh, many waters is the first thing. Did I already read all the way through it? Yes. Hold on just one second. Nope, I'll, th I'll finish reading. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit to the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns and blasphemies against God were written all over it. Does this sound familiar? This imagery has been repeated twice before with the other beasts. For the woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. 
a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon, the great mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Now we're going to go through it uh, verse by verse and see what kind of sense we can make out of it. Uh, first of all, let's point out the, the, uh, the many waters. What does that mean, the many waters? Now we just studied uh, last night and then again this morning what happened to the waters that went into Babylon? Dried up. The waters represent many people. Waters represent people. And so a river uh, is just, you know, the world's people going through it. And it uh, dried up. But, uh, but right now, she's still ruling over it. And then again, the great prostitute. Babylon, a worldwide religious confederacy, is made up of what? The unholy trinity, the counterfeit trinity that we studied before, and we'll, I'll verify this very, very clearly, that it's uh, the dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the land. That unholy counterfeit for God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know that it's in that order because it's the last one that, that performs the fire from heaven. So uh, all these are united in this. Now, now, a prostitute is one, and we'll pick up this uh, idea of adultery soon because uh, this is another description of hers, the great adulterer. Um, what is uh, a prostitute is one who commits adultery for money, right? We can't leave out the whole financial, the global financial picture. It's become mixed now with the religion. Now, adulteries itself is what? When, when you have gold and uh, you want to uh, make it stretch a little further, you can add some copper to it and uh, uh, re-smelt it. Now you have a gold brick, but there's some uh, copper in it. It's become adulterated. It's no longer pure. And it's in that sense that uh, very, very clearly this uh, great prostitute has adulterated the religion that she is now selling, in effect. This uh, woman, quite a woman, sometimes uh, evangelism is done with pictures like this set out on brochures. And uh, it's you have to kind of question the the rationale of that. I'm not sure if I'd want to pull people to my church who are interested in learning more about her. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Seems a, a little counterproductive. But the point of it here is that she is riding, <coughs> excuse me, she's riding the beasts. Now, what are beasts again in uh, prophetic symbols? Kingdoms, absolutely. So now we have this religious adulterer who is riding the beasts of the world, the nations of the world. It's uh, completely uh, unheard of. And the fact that this is marveled at, that we just read, that it was astounding, John himself was astounded to see it, is uh, uh, quite easy to understand in our sense, even more than his, because in our sense, what religion is going to dominate over, over kingdoms of the world? So it's, it's a startling thing. Now that's startling for our time. In the Middle Ages, was it startling? No, that's exactly what was going on in the Middle Ages. And, uh, and we'll get to it in a moment, but that's why uh, this uh, woman is described in another sense as the one who uh, astounded the world at her coming back, at her wound being healed. Because it's the same entity that oppressed during the Middle Ages that 
comes up again and resumes this dominance in world affairs. And it's astounding to anyone who would think about it that it's a possibility. It seems outrageous. But another issue here is that it's uh, the kings of this earth, that it's a, a political confederacy. And um, it's something that is not happening yet. So it's, uh, we're in that same situation we've talked about before, where prophecy that has been fulfilled increases our faith. Prophecy that has not been fulfilled, what should it do? It should make us be watchful. That's the point. Not proudful that we have it all figured out and it must be this way. Unfulfilled prophecy, you have to approach with great humility, but yet not be afraid to be watchful for it. Not to assume that it's so mysterious we can't get it, and it's, you know, uh, no one should even be trying to figure it out. We should be watchful. We should be trying to figure out, and at the same time humble, because there's not the same degree of certainty when it's not fulfilled yet. Now, in the Old Testament, the language of fornication and adultery was used when Israel aligned herself with pagan nations. So this isn't a new usage of this term of adultery. You could think of a number of situations in the Old Testament where it was used in this way. I'll just read uh, you two. Isaiah 121, see how Jerusalem, once so faithful, has become a prostitute. Once the home of justice and righteousness, she is now filled with murderers. And Jeremiah 3.1, if man divorces a woman and she goes and marries someone else, he will not take her back again, for that would surely corrupt the land. But you have prostituted yourself with many lovers, so why are you trying to come back to me, says the Lord. Now, interestingly enough, the... Um, there is this economic feature that's brought into this too. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. Now, when you are made drunk by something, what does it do to your judgment? If nothing else, it does that, doesn't it? It impairs your judgment. Now, scientists know a little bit more about how that works. The alcohol makes it more difficult for uh, the brain to get blood sugar. And so it just doesn't uh, work the way it's supposed to work. It does that with a number of drugs. And so by lessening our ability to use our brain, by depressing it, our judgment is distorted. Well, the same thing uh, happens but we get drunk by other things in a religious context. We get drunk by the wine of our immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. I want to forget why I repeated that. There must have been some point to it, but I can't think of it now, so I'm just going to move on. Revelation 14.8, Then another angel followed him, through the sky, shouting, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. Because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passion and morality. Now, what, what do you get out of that sense of the word made? Forced. The King James uses that terminology, forced. She forced the nations to drink of the wine of her immorality. So... This element of religious force uh, is something that is what she is all about. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had ten heads and ten horns, and blasphemies of God were written all over it. Now what, what does that mean? The woman is clothed in purple, which is often used for royal garments, and she self-describes herself as a queen. So there is this element of, of a rulership, 
and dominance. In the end time, she rules over the secular and political powers of her time. Perhaps not all of them. We don't really know. Ten could be specific or it could be symbolic. Or we don't really know. But, it's, uh, but she rules over nations. Now the ornaments of gold and precious stones are uh, something that we need to note here because uh, contrast that with the clothing of the saints. What are the saints clothed in? Pure white linen. A uh, linen is a natural fiber, and it has a, a, a natural, wholesome luster to it. The priests were in the temple were ordered to wear linen underneath their outer garments. So uh, inside and out, God's people are to be pure. We're not to focus on the uh, uh, on demonstrating our wealth by the way we dress. Most of our, us aren't in danger of that anyway, are we? But, uh, but we're not to do it. In case any of you get really rich, you get tempted to do that. Revelation 21, 11. Uh, it shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. This is the way that she uh, dresses. And this is uh, a reference most likely to the uh, ephod and the breastplate, which contained precious stones in the priest's garment. So we're talking again about a counterfeit religion. This is the head of a counterfeit religion. And instead of being simple and pure and undefiled, she's an adulterer who has a lavish outer appearance. They are to make these sacred garments, for, and this is the quote to demonstrate how Aaron was to dress. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons to wear when they serve me as priests. So give them fine linen, cloth, gold thread, and blue purple, and scarlet thread. You see some of the same components that the scarlet woman, who is a religious figure, who presides and dominates over political nations, how she's imitating the priest or the high priest. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held a goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immoralities. It's not for certain what the goblet represents, but it might very well have been the drink offerings that are in the sanctuary, which contained things that represented praise from God's people, as well as a propitiation of sin, but yet for her it's full of obscenities and the impurities of immorality. The mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the great mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. This might be, we don't know, it might be an allusion to what's written on the, the high priest's uh, uh, mitre. It, uh, if you want to make a reference to that, you can read about that in Exodus 28, verses 36 through 38. Revelation 18, 8. Therefore, these plagues will overtake her in a single day. Death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. Now, uh, this most likely is a reference to a punishment that was given to the family members of a priest who would commit adultery. Leviticus 21.9, if a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, she also defiles her father's holiness and she must be burned to death. Now, these are awfully strict commands. But you have to remember that these were set up at a time when God was present in his people in a way that is so clear that we can barely imagine it. It's people who were uh, with God's visible, present power, visible in the cloud, and they followed it by day 
and the cloud by fire by night. They had a different opportunity for us than us. And for us to understand the judgments that were put on them, it's not really fair to take our Church of Laodicea and uh, the freedom and the lackadaisical quality of life these days and then look at such harsh punishment in that context. This was a people that God had brought out of Egypt it's a people that he led through a mighty display of miracles. It's a people that he showed his presence to in a way that is mysterious to us. So for them to disobey direct commands from a God who is with them in that visible of a way is a different, apparently a different level of justice is required uh, to that. Now, uh, Let's see, the counterfeiting theme here. Have you noticed in all these elements, the counterfeiting of God's true church? Um, back in the Old Testament times, the imagery that he has is not random imagery, but it's imagery of God's holy church that's been twisted and defiled with an unholy purpose in mind, and that is to take glory away from God. Matthew 7. 21 through 23, true disciples. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, um, some texts say evildoers, and the literal translation is here it says you who break God's laws. Other translations say uh, evildoers, but the literal translation is those who are actually against God's laws. And that applies so much in the text that we are studying now in Revelation. Because not only are they breaking them as someone who believes in them or rejects them, they're setting up counterfeit ones. I could see that she was drunk. Drunk with the blood of God's holy people who are witnesses for Jesus. And I stared at her in complete amazement wouldn't you too if you saw in vision this this woman and representing this church power achieve such grandeur and yet her her actual identity as someone who blasphemes against god what does blaspheme mean again remember that's what jesus was accused of he was accused of being a blasphemer because he said he claimed to be God. He healed someone, and uh, and he he let that reference inference be made that he was God. And and the way he did it was, uh, he said exactly um, which is better, that I heal you, or I say your sins are forgiven therefore healing you. And who can forgive sins? Only God. So that's how they, they got him for blaspheming. Now, uh, it's not surprising that, uh, that, sh that John will be astonished at seeing her. Part of the deception is that it is such an evil power, clearly, to John, an evil power that has become a godly appearing religious power that assumes such a huge amount of authority that it actually rules over nations. It was astonishing to him, and it's no less astonishing to us. So there she saw he saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns and blasphemies were written all over it. 
So this uh, harlot is uh, is not new. It's a, it's a repetition of the sea beast that we've seen before. The sea beast is the counterfeit again to the ministry of who? The sea beast now? Christ. Yep. It, it's a little confusing, but if you remember, the dragon represents the father. The sea beast represents or, or counterfeits Christ. And, uh, and then the Holy Spirit is counterfeited by the beast that came from the land, the earth beast. Revelation 16, 13, And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We've seen that uh, before. The counterfeiting of these is a work that uh, goes on under, it grows under the ministry of the woman who rides the nations. So these, these three are working um, in harmony with her. The false prophet, uh, uh, I'm glad I did that because I forgot to explain that. The, uh, the false prophet is another name for the land beast, the representative or the, the one who uh, is counterfeited by the beast from the land. So uh, the, the theme of the counterfeit religion is still holding true. Babylon and her allies. allies. Now we're moving on to uh, 7 through 18, but we're still following through in Revelation 17. We're just moving on to the next series of texts. So continue following along if you can in Revelation. I'm going to read these uh, texts through. There's uh, a number of them, but don't worry, I'll go back uh, over them again more one by one. Why are you so amazed, the angel asked? I would tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. Now what we're going to see is whether or not the angel's explanation, he says, I'll tell you the mystery of her. We'll see if his explanation lines up with all the texts that we took from the Old Testament to show where John got this imagery. And it'll verify it or it'll prove us wrong. The beast you saw was once alive but isn't now. And yet he will soon come out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. This calls for mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represents the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns, and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and their authority. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them, <laughs> excuse me, because he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings, and his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. What is the illusion here that we studied this morning? To Armageddon that final battle. Then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling represents masses of people of every nation and language. So are we pulling this, this symbolic understanding out of nowhere? Absolutely not. The angel himself is verifying our interpretation of what the waters represent. And so the drying up of the waters later as part of of the Armageddon experience 
that parallels what happened in Babylon when Babylon was defeated is what the angel himself is saying here. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all heat the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. Now we're talking about Armageddon itself, where um, her following has turned on her. For God has put a plan into her mind, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast so the word of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Now, I know that's a lot, but we're going to break it down. We won't be able to go every word in it, but we'll break it down enough to see if this fits the description of the the ministry of the other beasts in this false trinity. So Babylon, again, is the political, unified trinity, evil, counterfeit trinity, that is now under a religious dominating ruler. Now, John's actual vision ended. And with these texts, what you have happening, you have an angel explaining it. And uh, it seems like a confusing series of interpretations, but there's detailed information in it, which when we go back and link it up, it'll all, all make sense. So uh, the beast's function during the end time is to, um, to in one sense, be uh, ruled by her, but when you think of this unified end time religion, who's behind it all? Who's, who are they all serving? The dragon, just as the Holy Spirit uh, is sent by Christ. Christ was given authority by the Father. So it's this unity of purpose that uh, is functioning here. The woman represents a worldwide unit of religion. The beast symbolizes worldwide political union. Now we don't know if we know that it's worldwide and it's global. That doesn't mean that necessarily every uh, political entity is behind it. But um, all who share in her wealth are, and all those who are not oppressed by her are. So it may be somewhat of a moot point. So who is the usurper of God's power? Amazingly, it will be religion itself, this false religion itself. Although she dresses and acts like a church, this Babylon has its roots in this place. Um, do you remember the story of uh, the actual construction of uh, Babylon? I love this particular picture because uh, what is it? Uh, what does it appear to actually be built on? Kind of a, a crooked foundation, isn't it? So they're trying to. You remember the story in the Old Testament where they um, they actually um, are trying to build something up to reach God. So what does this represent? back then in its original context. And why did God then um, frustrate their efforts by confusing their languages? Yes. I couldn't quite hear your word, Larry. Yep, rebellion against God's plan. Yep, rebellion and against God's plan of salvation, really, isn't it? Uh, hmm? Absolutely. Satan motivates us to rebel. And what more clever way could he do it than insinuate that we have to do something ourselves to build ourselves up to heaven? It's, it's an amazing symbolic structure, this uh, the source of Babylon. And then uh, we all know the story that he confused her uh, language, and uh, uh, and we know it now as the, the Tower of Confusion, the Tower of Babel. 
Now, all apostasy goes back to this. Uh, uh, to this. And, and actually, the exact same fundamental flaw in our human nature was reflected by the children of the first sinners. Do you remember how? God's response to the first sin was to uh, slay a lamb and to cover them, making a promise, uh, pointing to his future sacrifice where he would die to cover their nakedness. And so this sacrificial institution was created where they would rehearse that promise of God that their sins would be forgiven and, cut, and their nakedness covered by a loving God. What did the first children do? One of them um, went along with it and sacrificed animals. What did the other one sacrifice? Some grain. The, the, um, his own uh, works of his hand. One of them uh, was a, a, a had herds, and the other uh, uh, grew things in the field. So he took it upon himself, well, this is what I do. This is what I have to sacrifice. Isn't what I have to sacrifice good enough? No. It doesn't matter how precious it is to you because it's only one sacrifice and it's Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the only sacrifice that can have salvation merit to us. It's the only way. So uh, that delusion started actually even before this. That's a, it's a wonderful imagery. And the what happened then, if you think about it, before the languages were confused, all the people worked in political harmony to build this, didn't they? So this image then is being used because that's what best represents what will happen under the Scarlet Woman. Daniel 3, 7. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. What is this a symbol of here? A unification, a political unification has, we just saw the one application of it, it has a celebration of man's own works and a denial over the necessity to worship Jesus Christ and to have his atoning sacrifice cover our nakedness. Instead, it's our own works. Now, when you unify political structure with the religious framework, what you have is persecution for God's people. It happens every time. And that's what happened with King Nebuchadnezzar. What happened when he set up that system? Do you remember? He, uh, he, he set up a system. Uh, think about it just for a minute. He set up a system where all the people three times a day, I forget now, were to uh, bow towards the statue and to worship it and to pray to the statue. It was a statue just so happens to be of King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> which is another thing about religious authority being mingled with the state, is it just leads to insane things like this. So Daniel was a faithful child of God. What did he do? His custom was, and I forget, three or five times, three times he would bow to his creator God and worship him. And then his political enemies went to the king and said, hey, look what he's doing. And King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it was his own law. He had to enforce it. So he threw Daniel in the lion's den. And you know the story, God's miraculous intervention. And then what effect did that have on King Nebuchadnezzar? 
Yes, but he acknowledged. Um, you're, you're thinking of earlier, I think, when he had the visions. Yes, he acknowledged. Uh, he did do that. He uh, gave justice. Uh, but he acknowledged that the God of Daniel was the true God. He acknowledged him. And then just as it will happen in the end in Armageddon, within this political religious alliance, they destroyed each other. Did Daniel rush in with a sword to attack his enemies or to defend his life? The king attacked them. They attacked each other. It seems to be what happens when people unite against God. They seem to destroy themselves, is the point of it. Now this power, this, this sense of, of grandeur of building up to the sky, it's uh, manifested itself in the same medieval structure when government was united with religion. They had this sense of, of, uh, of each little territory, actually. Uh, part of their identity would be how magnificent their struggle would be. And who, whose back were these edifices built on? The poor workers of the country who lived in oftentimes squalor and just was kept with you know, just enough to barely eat. They're the ones who sacrificed to build these amazing structures. I happen to love architecture. And I grew up in Chicago where even neighborhood churches were magnificent edifices of marble and carved stone. My grandfather was a stone mason. So I just kind of love this stuff. And yet, um, it's built on the back of poor people. This happens to be a picture of uh, the largest uh, cathedral in Europe. Um, it's in uh, Germany, I believe. It's uh, uh, kind of awesome to look at, isn't it? It's the beast that is associated with all alliances of secular and political unity, just as in the early beasts. It's fairly identified what happened. The beast you saw was once alive, but is it now? And yet he will soon come out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. Are you getting kind of the sense of it? When we repeat the concept from all these different angles, is it all coming together? Such a political union happened in the past. As a matter of fact, it was the status quo of mankind until fairly recently to have this kind of freedom. Do you remember where the the true church we studied earlier, where did she, is it the woman, remember, was identified as the true church? And where did she escape to? From the place of many waters to the wilderness. To the wilderness, where for a time she was kept safe because of the uh, relative lack of people and the relative lack of the political structures that those peoples had that repressed religious freedom. So it's, uh, it becomes clearer and clearer. Now, uh, it's the people who will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast. And it's um, amazing to me what the religious freedom, and I believe some crazy things in the development of my uh, spirituality. I would, <clears throat> there are some things that are so crazy, I would never share them from the pulpit. Because you would think anyone who could ever have thought those things 
You get asked by wife, but don't tell them what they were, but she'll tell you that there are some crazy things that you could think, religious things. So, uh, but I was free to do all those things. I was perfectly free to think them. And it's amazing to me to think that in this country, where you could burn flags if you want to, you could talk about your president any way you want to, you see the nastiest things, and it's all protected, and it's all good that it is. It's amazing to me to think that there will be an end to this, and it'll change. But you know, I've mentioned this uh, in another sermon, when if you feel amazed, like this is just too incredible, I just, this can't happen. Just think about what happened in Germany after World War I. Think about how when you combine extreme financial stress and chaos with uh, insane hope in a leader that happened under Hitler, look at the crazy things that happened with one of the world's most civilized countries, uh, uh, the one who gave us uh, Einstein, Brahms, Bach, Mendelssohn, Mozart, Beethoven, some of the most civilized, creative geniuses devolved to the nature of the beast. Because that's what happens when you combine religion with state power, and it's astonishing. This beast eventually will go to eternal destruction. The resurrected time will be fairly short. It'll be amazing, but it'll be short. So um, if you don't see it happening now, and if you can't see it lasting, that's okay. The Bible doesn't say it's going to last a long time. Just that it's going to happen. How long did Hitler last? About five and a half years or so. Something like that. He, I mean, of course, he was trying to get power earlier than that. But when he actually got the power, he lasted only about that long. When they complete their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them. So you see, this is an isolated prophecy about this beast who will uh, surprise many, astound the world. It's, it's referred to in other texts. Revelation 13.3, I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed, and the whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. See how John repeats the prophecy over and over again, each time giving us from different points of view, expanding on the depth of the information. And it's not because he's a bad writer. It's just that's how the visions were given to him, and he just records them as he received them. And the people will be amazed. Another text that has the same concept, the people will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died or appeared to have a fatal wound. The women, the religious powers, is riding the beast. What an unusual thing to have happened. And yet we're told that that will happen. Why are you so amazed? The angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. This calls for a mind with understanding, though. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Now many people think that the seven hills represent the seven hills of Rome, because that, after all, is the seat of this medieval church that had authority over the kings of the world. But 
um, although it, it kind of fits so nicely with that, it, it's not good scholarship. If you read on a little bit more, it says that uh, if you look at the Seven Hills, it says that uh, the government, this uh, Babylon will be uh, built on this. But then it goes on to say that, um, that uh, what does it say? Um, maybe I'll have it on the next text. This calls for a mind with understanding the seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills of the women world, but they also represent seven kings and have mountains ever represented kings before. Where? Nebuchadnezzar, no, he had a statue of himself. And then there was the, the uh, kingdom of God came down, and that's what you're thinking of, the rock that destroyed uh, the, the statue. Mm. It wasn't made by man. That's what you're thinking of. That uh, this rock that came uh, from uh, heaven and uh, destroyed uh, the statue in his vision was not one that was made by man, meaning it represented the coming of Christ. Uh, Again, a different version of Armageddon, but this time from Daniel. So I understand your thinking, but but actually, it to me, it uh, it says that uh, first of all, it says uh, hills, not mountains, were the woman's rules, and they all also represent seven kings. We may not really quite know what the uh, seven hills mean. I myself, I kind of um, uh, don't like to. Uh, focus on that representing Rome uh, because it says that uh, uh, in the next verse is that five kings have already fallen, the sixth now reigns, and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. So if it was literal mountains, it just doesn't quite make sense that uh, you know five of the mountains around Rome would fall. And it being a, a political structure, a worldwide political structure, that wouldn't really change uh, much uh, if, if that's what it meant. So I, I tend to think that it doesn't do that. But if it did, it would uh, uh, it's okay with me. I just, I just don't know that that's true. So, um, But I do know that the five kings have already fallen, the sixth now reigned, and the seventh is yet to come. Where have you heard that language before? Talking about the past kingdoms. It's an exact um, uh, repetition of the kingdoms that have already come and gone, and the one uh, that is, and the one that will be. Do you remember from, uh, from Daniel? The exact same thing. We're told that the woman uh, sits on those uh, mountains and over these uh, heads, the, uh, the evil um, trinity power of that woman. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer is the eighth king. He's like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. Now, if you're getting impatient, hold on a little bit longer, because it gets temporarily worse. On top of this, then there's ten more kings that rule just for a brief moment and then are part of the Armageddon uh, battle amongst themselves. So uh, we are about to be uh, overwhelmed with kings. Now some of them we can make some sense out of. Some of them we can't yet. The 10 additional kings that are right around the corner is uh, something that is, uh, is, is really pretty much beyond us. It's in the unfulfilled prophecy. But this is referring to, um, and the uh, text that we just passed is, uh, is a little bit clearer because of a parallel in Daniel. Who can remember what those kingdoms were that uh, would fit this? Actually, let me go back as we, uh, rather than um, look at on this one, I'm going to go back so we could see the other text easier, this one. Who remembers what any of those kingdoms were? Don't be shy, just shout them out. 
Yes? 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 Yes. All these empires that Daniel predicted in the future, well, actually, he didn't, they all weren't in the future. Some of them were in the future, and some of them were in his present, and some of them were in his past. And now it's the same way here. These now were in the past. And the six now reigns. The five that have fallen would be uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. Very likely. If it turned out to be different, I'm not going to complain to God about it. But it appears this is what is being referred to. And the one uh, that is not come would be the manifestation of a, this. Remember, this is written from his time perspective. The one that is to come would be whom? when Rome became Christian, it became a new entity, the Holy Roman Empire, the foundation for modern Europe. And um, this did not, uh, uh, pagan Rome existed as one of the five kings, but this other uh, uh, religious entity that came over was, uh, was not. Uh, so that is the one that uh, is uh, to come. Rome was the one who is now reigning. And Christian Rome, uh, Pepal Rome, was the one that was yet to come. But his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery. This is going back now to Revelation 13. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. That is yet to come. Now, the beast you saw was once alive. Or current in our text now, back in, in uh, Revelation 7, 17. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. It will be amazing. It absolutely will be amazing. And he will do things to make the world marvel after it. Do you remember the main thing that this power does under the uh, species of the counterfeit Holy Spirit? The sea beast? Fire from heaven. Absolutely. So it will be amazing that it's alive and it will perpetuate people's belief in it by these miracles that who predicted? All the Bible writers. There's, there's references to all of them. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 24 talked about all the, the false miracles and the false prophets we'll have to look out for. Thessalonians talked about it. Paul wrote a lot about it, that there will be uh, a power that will rise and will perform miracles. We will not be able to trust our senses. Let me read, uh, well, I can see this here. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and he is called and chosen and faithful that you and I hopefully will be with him. Then the angel said to me, The waters where the prostitute is ruling represents masses of people of every nation and language. We, we went through that uh, before I went. Uh, lay on this. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. So in this end time, as a result of the plagues that are coming, even perhaps as the seventh seal and the seventh plague is given from the temple of God himself, right before Jesus comes, this plague causes them to turn on one another and to turn even on their religious leader and destroy one another. That's how this battle of Armageddon is won. 
For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give the authority to the scarlet beast for the words of God will be fulfilled. Now why would God do that? Why would he send these last plagues if revelation, if uh, probation has already closed, God's people are sealed, God's rebellious ones have the mark of the beast? Why would he do that? Hmm? Yes. Well, a little bit more detail than that. To show his power and glory, but very specifically to show the unit, the unfallen universes, the, the hosts of angels and people yet to come, to show them that this is the result of rebellion. That he allows it to happen. He even allows a fire to be called down as a miracle from uh, at the ministry of the sea beast to make the whole world astonished. He allows it all. He allows it all to go, but only for a brief time. And he warns us now about that so we'll be prepared for it. But he allows it so that the results will be known to everyone of the insanity that happens when you rebel against the one who gives life, the ones who, the one who gave the law to guide the successful, ongoing success of life. When you obey God, when you disobey God, you disobey the law giver, the creator God, things are not going to go well for you. God doesn't have to to punish you so directly. The life that you create for yourself is hell enough. And that's exactly what Armageddon does. It shows just what misery results from rebellion against God. The question is, do we want to be a part of that or not? We're warned. We have lots of opportunities. We have lots of knowledge, but the decision is for each one of us to make. Do you sense within yourself a rebellious spirit? Oh, I, I sure do in myself. I was a uh, uh, one of the healthiest living people you can imagine. I used to work in a health food store. I ate nothing but organic stuff, a macrobiotic diet. I just ate so well until, until people showed me about the health message and all the things that you're supposed to do and all the things you're not supposed to do. And I took it in for a year or two, then all of a sudden it was like, ugh, I just felt so rebellious. And so I did crazy things against my own health uh, just out of a sense of a perverse freedom. It was like, um, <laughs> I remember the first time after a number of years, years of a very, very pure diet, and ironically, it was after I just finished a three-year seminary program. And I was driving away from the seminary, living this life of, of prayer and studiousness in God's word. And I just had this overwhelming desire. I'm not even going to tell you what it is, because some of you would think it was uh, terrible, and some of you would think, what? I eat that every day. So I'm not even going to tell you what it is. It was just stuff that for me was terrible, but it just seemed so delightful. Paul writes about that, that the law can stir up this sense of rebelliousness in us. And that's why he says that the law of sin and death you know, can't save you. It just stirs up rebelliousness. 
It's the grace of Jesus Christ that can save us. That doesn't stir up rebelliousness. So, choose you this day who you will serve. Will you serve the God of your fathers? Or will you go your own way? Think about this sense. Internalize this rebelliousness that's in you, because we all have it, and give it up to God. Would you please? You won't regret it. Let's bow our heads and pray. We're not going to have a written um, thing today. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the ministry of your word to us. We thank you that you give us the ability to understand spiritual things. We know we don't always, but we know that you want us to be able to. So we ask you to help us to understand every single thing that is necessary for our salvation. We ask you to make that crystal clear to us. Then through the ministry of your spirit, give us the ability to follow you faithfully, to be clothed with your righteousness, and to remain close to you, so that we will be at your side at that last moment when you come again. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.